Hello and welcome to Master Gardening. I'm your host Bud Kwok and today's show we're going to walk through my backyard and we're going to talk about native plants. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. <music> native plants, they've always been popular, but they're being more and more popular every day. In the 2019 Garden Club of Kentucky presidents, Donna Smith, hey Donna, she had a special project on natives. The Garden Club of Kentucky has always been big on natives, but she took it to another level. The National Garden Club president, Mary Warshower, has made it her, one of her special projects. She appointed me, Bud Kwok, uh, coordinator for the horticultural committee for the National Garden Club and Victoria Bergeson, the Environmental Concerns Committee uh, coordinator, to come up with an initiative to move the native plants to the top of their website. Uh, right now if you uh, visit that website you have to drill down into the website and there's native plants, there's wildflowers, there's invasive plants, committees specifically for those plants. But we came up with a Gardening with Nature initiative that will be a program. So when you go to the website, the programs are right across the top of the website. You tap on programs and you can see uh, Gardening with Nature right, up, right at the top. Um, my garden, uh, most people don't realize that they have native plants. Most people have native plants. And let me point out a few in my garden right here. Uh, this is a uh, black-eyed Susan. It's not blooming yet, doggone it, <laughs> but it's native. Right above it, this is what they call a ditch lily, and it is native to Kentucky. Uh, and many of these that are native to Kentucky will be native to most of the states across the Midwest. Not California, Maine, Florida, Arizona, but the Midwest. Uh, in the back back there are three hibiscus I uh, planted. Hibiscus, believe it or not, is native to Kentucky. Those aren't. I found out after I planted them that those are tropical hibiscus. There's two different kinds of hibiscus, well, there's probably more than that. But tropical hibiscus have a dark green shiny leaf. And that's what those have. Those will die this winter if I don't dig them up and put them in my greenhouse. If they look really good, I might do that. But a, a hardy hibiscus has a heart-shaped dull green uh, leaf on it. And they will come back. They will die back to the ground and come back every year. That's a hibiscus, and, and it's native to Kentucky. Let me read a couple things about natives. Now, this is a paragraph off the website of um, Doris Jackson. She is the chairman of Wildflowers and Natives for the National Garden Club. Wildflower and native plant gardens provide a unique, colorful landscape that is pollinator-friendly and hardy nature. Once plants have been established, these gardens require very little maintenance, yet provide vivid color and wildlife habitat for many years. Wildflowers are generally resistant to disease, and native plants have evolved to survive in their local climate. They're used to the weather, they're used to the cold, they're used to how hot it gets, and they're used to how wet and dry it gets. Let me read one more thing. This is Victoria uh, Bergeson's article that she did for the National Garden Club. And I'll read a paragraph of hers. The nature ecosystems in the Western Hemisphere have developed independently for over 80 million years. Microorganisms in the soil, plants, and animals evolved together to create a balanced system. The balance has been long disturbed by overdevelopment, pollution, insecticides, and the planting of lawns, which require mowing, irrigation, and chemical inputs. That's just part of the article, it's a great article. Okay, before we leave this area, I'd like to point out a, an invasive, extremely, it's not a native of Kentucky, but let me point this out and how to get rid of it. You've probably already heard of nut sedge. There's millions of nut sedges in my yard, millions. <laughs> It's, I, I, I don't worry about that too much because I'm going to redo my lawn next year and I hope I can keep it out then. But it also gets in the beds. And if I hadn't kept killing it, it would have already taken over my beds. And here's, here's one right here. It doesn't look like much. I do this about once a week. 
If you, if you pull that up, it's got little nuts that will stay in the soil and you'll have 10. So you can't pull them up because then that multiply. They want you to pull them up. Put Roundup on it. It acts like it's dying, but it's not. You dig it up with a trowel along with a bunch of dirt and you throw it in your neighbor's yard, but that doesn't help either. You, it's almost impossible to get all the nuts. There's only one way I've figured out how to kill it, and you, <laughs> this is pretty crazy. I don't do this in my yard, but in my beds, I, I, about once a week or once every 10 days, I take a paintbrush with concentrate Roundup kind of stuff and paint that. That will kill it in about two weeks. Okay, but <laughs> I can't tell you, I've been doing this for years and it's still in my beds. So I know if I haven't been doing this, the beds will be took, taken over by this stuff. And it's, <laughs> it looks very innocent. And if you mow it in your yard, it looks really good, but it's not. Let's go take a look at the tomatoes and peppers and see how they're doing. We're here in my tomato and pepper patch, which all of you already know. And by the way, before I get started, uh, we did a show on tomatoes and peppers, 12 months of tomatoes and peppers. Uh, it should be out there on YouTube. If you'll type in, in the search window, Bud Quok, Q-U-A-L-K, Bud Quok, type it in the search window. It'll bring up most of my shows that, not the ones before YouTube was even invented, but uh, you, you can see the peppers and tomatoes from, from planting all the way through harvesting and cleaning up. But I'm just gonna give you a status right now. It's late spring here in Western Kentucky, and this is what they look like. And pretty good year. I've had some years not this good. Uh, if you notice, they're all in cages. I love cages. I love raised beds. These are all tied together. The peppers are not gonna blow over, but the tomatoes, if you had a big wind, it would blow all these tomatoes over on the sidewalk. But the cages they're in are all connected, so it's one big cage, and unless we have a tornado, they're not gonna blow over. Okay. Now, you'll notice, you can see these yellow leaves down here on the, on the floor. Uh, the, the, that's the funguses. They're getting ready, they're coming. <laughs> We've already done a bunch of stuff to prevent the funguses, but I will still spray this. It's an attachment I can put on my hose that sp will spray fungicide, and I can do both of these completely in five minutes, spray them all. I'll also spray my, uh, my, go my gourds, my cucumbers, and my squash because they are uh, susceptible to uh, funguses also. These are not, as far as I know, native to Kentucky, okay? But thank heaven somebody brought them in. Back in the day, they wouldn't eat tomatoes because they said they were poison. Guess what? They were right. Tomatoes are poison. So are the peppers. All nightshades have a built-in, herb not herbicide, but fungicide and insecticide built into them. That's poison to humans. So if you don't have any problems with your stomach or your intestines, no big deal. But if you have problems with your intestines or a problem with your stomach, cut out nightshades just for a little while and see if that might help. The other nightshades are potatoes. Oh my gosh. But potatoes, most of the poison is in the skin, so lay off the skins of the, of the potatoes. Also eggplant. There are some others, but those are the main ones people eat. Okay, since these aren't native, let me tell you where you can go and find out more about natives. There's some books I'd like for, to recommend. I hope you have a pencil and paper here. Uh, the Living Landscape by Doug Tallamy. Doug Tallamy is the czar of native plants. He also has Nature's Best Hope that is the Bible for native plants. Carol Otisane, the Native Plant Primer, is also a good book. And there's a number of other ones, probably hundreds, but those are the ones that I like. Also, websites. Go to the, your state native plant website. Go to North American, uh, North America's Native Plant Society. Uh, go to the National Garden Club website, your state like the Louisiana State Garden Club website, um, Audubon Society, uh, there's a U.S. Forestry, there's all kinds of websites out there you can go to uh, and check out more and more native information. And I'm going to really quickly talk about fertilization 
for tomatoes and peppers. Two years ago, I put nitrogen on my tomatoes and peppers. Man, was I, that was a great idea. That my peppers, I had eight foot peppers. I'm, have you ever seen an eight foot pepper? I mean, it's just, I couldn't even reach the top of it. Eight foot peppers, nine foot tomato plants, no fruit. I got just very little fruit off of it, and I found out after I did that, that just two years ago, and I've been doing this for, for uh, Dan thinks 100 years, but at least 30 or 40 years I've been doing this, and I just found out two years ago, don't put nitrogen on peppers. If you want to put fertilizer on them, 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 15 is good. Um, some people say never fertilize peppers. Don't put any fertilizer on them, but if you do, the best is to put the, like 5, 20, 20, that first number in the three number uh, digits is nitrogen. Did you see that bee hit me in the finger? <laughs> uh, low nitrogen, high potassium and, and phosphorus. That's what you want to put on peppers if you've got the guts to do that. Okay, and I had my first tomato uh, uh, a week ago uh, and it had the whole bottom rotted out of it. I think the birds had got to it and started eating it. And, the, and I, you couldn't tell it from the top. It looked great from the top. But once you picked it, and you realize it's rotted on the bottom. But usually the first tomato or two are usually not the best tomatoes. But I think I'm gonna have a good crop and we'll come back and visit this, this again in, in late summer and see how they're doing. A lot of people uh, think that natives are like the prairie. They're like grasses and weeds and stuff and really ugly plants. But if you notice the ones I pointed out already, and we didn't look at one, but tall flocks. I had some tall flocks. Tall flocks is one of my favorite plants. It's beautiful. It's a native. I've got uh, an onion patch down here I want to talk about next, Dan. Let's go down there. This onion patch, I, I, I'm not sure about onions, whether they're, they're, I'm sure there's some kind of onion that is uh, native to Kentucky. I'm not sure if the, the, the hybrid uh, onions are. Uh, I'd like to talk about the onions and the garlic. The garlic is ready just about. If you see it turning brown, I've already cut off the tops, the seed pods, the, the energy's gone down into the, 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 the bulb. And when they turn brown like this, they're, they're ready to be dug, not pulled. You pull onions because the onion's on top of the ground. The only thing that's under the ground in, on an onion is the roots. The, bulb, the, the onion bulb is above the ground. With the, with the uh, garlic, it's a below ground, and if you try to pull it up, you're probably going to break it off at the, at the neck right here, and, let, and that's not good. So you take this and you cut off. You leave about one inch of the stem on there and let it dry. You, you do the same process with the onions. You don't put it out in the sun, you don't let it get wet, you put it in the shade for about a week, maybe in the garage shed, don't get, let the rain or the heavy dew get to it, and then it's ready to store. And this, this garlic, I'm using garlic right now that I made last year, so it'll last the whole year if you do it properly, store it properly. And you see these little bulbettes on here, each one of these little things will become a big bulb like this if you have the patience to do it. Next year, it'll be about an inch in diameter, and then it, it takes, takes at least two or three years for it to get big enough to use. And oh, by the way, before I go any further with the onions, we did a 12-month show also on, from the, for the onions and the garlic to tell you everything you need to know about onions and garlic. And it, type my name in the, that search window, Bud Kwok, Q-U-A-L-K, in the search window on YouTube, it'll bring up most of my shows, including this one. Okay, now you've noticed that my, my onions are laying down. They look like heck. Okay, but this is what they do. Uh, and if you go to that show, you'll, 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 you go to the whole smear. But just quickly, I'll tell you that how big your onion is depends on how many spikes come up. So you're putting uh, uh, high nitrogen fertilizers that are on them until it starts to bulb. Once it starts to bulb, there's no more spikes. So you quit putting nitrogen on it when it starts to bulb. Once it lays down, all the, all the onions will lay down and they, the necks will start to break. The necks will break and then they'll start healing. 
so they'll store really good. The only onions that'll store good are the ones that the neck is broken and it is, as it dried that, that neck healed. So many of these are, the, the necks have already broken, so I'll go ahead and, and break off the rest of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, it looks like, that, what the heck, that's, a, that's not a good job. Break all the necks off so they'll all harvest at exactly the same time. And I'll do more of this off camera, Dan, <laughs> unless you want me to take a half an hour to do all that. Let's talk about what you can expect with natives. Uh, I've got a list here of about two dozen natives to, to Kentucky. And like I said, probably all the Midwest, there are thousands of natives. But this is just a few, and I want to prove to you that they're, they're not just prairie grass and weeds and, and stuff like that that you see along the ditches. Let me read these really quickly. I promise I'll re read them quickly, Dan. Uh, maiden hair fern, buckeye tree, service berry tree, columbine, one of our favorites, walking stick, jack in the pulpit, black chokeberry, milkweed, which is invasive. And that brings up another point. Some natives are invasive. On, and nature wants it like that, so you've got to be careful not to use native invasives. Uh, I use the milkweed for, that's one of the main plants for the monarch butterfly, but I have it, if we get back there to it, I'll show it, it's in a pot, it's in a big huge pot. It dies back to the ground, comes back up every year for, for the monarchs that, that come through here. Papa. Baptisia, I've got one of those around the side of the house, false blue indigo, sedges, hornbean tree, red bud tree, yellow wood tree, turtle heads, coreopsis. I've got a bunch of coreopsis in my uh, garden and I bet you do too. Uh, red twig dogwood, purple prairie clover, persimmon tree, cone flowers. It's my wife's favorite flower and one of mine too. I've got a bunch of those. Joe pie weed, Wild geranium, Jerusalem artichoke, and hibiscus that we talked about earlier, St. John's wort, liatris, I've got one of those at my gate, lobelia, honeysuckle, Solomon seal, bluebells, bee balm, which is marnarda, paxandria, foxglove, I've got, foxgloves is not blooming anymore, but that was one of my big blooms this spring, uh, black-eyed black Susan, which I've got a bunch of those, elderberry, goldenrod, aster, spiderwort, and viburnum. And there, those are all viburnum. See how those beautiful red, those were all white flowers this spring. Those plants are four years old, maybe, maybe five. They were about six inches when I planted them there five years ago. <laughs> They've pretty well taken over. What do you think, Dan? Okay, um, by the way, the squash down here, when we came to, the United, to uh, North America, the Indians were growing squash corn, squash, and, and climbing beans. So those are all native uh, to the United States and to Kentucky, by the way. These big, huge sunflowers, these are all volunteer sunflowers. Those are uh, native. Um, and these dills, I don't know if you can <laughs> see how big these dill are. I didn't plant any of those, they're everywhere. If you plant dill one time, You've got dill the rest of your life. <laughs> it is invasive, but it's, it's not, not bad, it's beautiful. And I'll, I'll pull them all up and they'll come back next year and once they drop the seeds. Let's go back here and look at my bird feeders at a closer range next, okay? And we'll talk some more about natives. <music> You're probably asking yourself, what can I do to further the advancement of natives? Well, I've got some good answers for you. One, get rid of your yard. Uh, grass yards are not good for pollinators, they're not good for wildlife. Uh, they're just good to look at, I guess. If you'll notice my garden in my backyard, there is no grass. I've got a little tiny bit of grass over there by my fire pit. That's the only grass I have. So. If you've got a big backyard, portion off part of it and till it up and put some good uh, perennials, maybe some shrubs in there, some boxwoods or anything that you can think of that might be native uh, to your area. Or you don't have to be 100% natives. Or you can put anything you want in there, but get rid of that grass. If you've got a, a section back there, big enough section, you can just go ahead and let the grass grow. 
Plant wildflowers, have a wildflower garden. Most wildflowers are, are natives. If you've got a fence row behind your house, plant some wildflowers in that fence row. Or if you've got a river or a creek, along the banks, many times people don't mow up the next to the river or the bank of a creek, sow some wildflowers in there. Okay, uh, so much <laughs> for grasses. Plant for hummingbirds, plant for birds, plant for insects, plant for pollinators. We're gonna get into some pollinators here in just a minute, uh, Dan, your favorite. Um, behind me here, I have some bird feeders, put out some bird feeders. Let me give you a little background on these, on these uh, bird feeders. You gotta be careful, you gotta do what you want. You can't just put out bird feeders if you have stray cats running around. The cats will, will use those as traps to, to eat your birds. They can jump about this high, okay? So I raised my bird feeders up just above the level that cats like to jump and, and grab the birds. Okay, that took care of the cats. Raccoons, I live in the middle of a town. I have a, I'm in the suburb here in the neighborhood. I have raccoons that come at night. They would, get, they would climb the tree and get, the, get the, uh, the, 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 the feeders to get on the ground, bust them open, break your feeders, eat all, the, eat all the seeds in one night. So I took them out and put them on my limb up here on top. I put them out far enough that the raccoons can't get to them. Now the raccoons can get, can get to this suet. I have a dozen uh, different woodpeckers that come and eat on this suet. They love this yellow suet especially. At night, if I don't take that suet in, the raccoons will eat the whole thing. They know how to unhook that, but sometimes they don't even do that. They just eat it through the, through the, uh, uh, gr the grate. So I take that in at night. If I forget, guess <laughs> I have to break open a new one. They only cost a dollar a piece, but you know, if you go through a dollar a day, that, that sometimes can add up, I don't know. Uh, one thing that the raccoons can do, they don't do it very often, They'll get up on this limb and they'll pull that rope up and, and then unbuckle it. See this little hook right here? Then they can unhook the buck and it'll drop to the ground and they'll eat everything. They don't do that very often, but they do. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how they were getting that on the ground because the, the hook is clear up here. They, they pull that thing up. Okay, some more things that you can do. Mow taller. If you've got grass, let it grow a little taller. You believe it or not, that's better for the lawn. The lawn's healthier if it's not cut real close. And when you cut it, don't cut three or four inches off of it. It doesn't like that. Let it grow up a little taller and don't cut it as often. If it's tall grass, then maybe the pollinators and the insects and those type of things can get in there and, and, and live. Uh, natives are really, they are uh, disease resistant, drought resistant, cold weather resistant, and they're good food for wildlife. Plant food for wildlife. Berries, uh, fruit, uh, wildlife <laughs> loves those things. They don't have to be native, but plant fruit and berries and the, for the wildlife in your area. One more thing before we move to the next spot, Dan, I wanna encourage everybody to get with your community organizations, your beautification committee, your tree board, and push natives. Now, a good way to do that is, if you're not a garden club member, join a garden club. Garden clubs are great. <laughs> They're not just for women anymore, believe it or not. And they have a bigger voice than an individual does around the community. Many times the garden club is taking care of all the gardens in the, in the city. They may be beautifying the front of the courthouse or the city hall. Uh, cemeteries, library gardens are taking care of all that so they have a big reputation. So when they go to the tree board and say, hey tree board, when you plant those trees along the, tr uh, the street, let's get some natives in here. Okay, join a garden club. You'll, you'll have friends that you, 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 the, for the rest of your life. Okay, let's move on. Let's go back here and I want to show Dan the bees that stung him last time we had this show. This is the side of my house, and it's the hot side of my house. You can tell with the sun's beating down on us. Uh, and by the way, I cheat. I don't water all this by hand. I've got an irrigation system that comes on every other day and waters all this. 
Um, I, don't, I don't think I could, <laughs> I used to water this last year. I had an irrigation put, system put in this last fall. These are, are a, a friend of the black-eyed Susans, that's native, Coreopsis, that's native. These daisies over, white daisies over here are, 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 are native. Uh, behind me, uh, the bees, they are not native. <laughs> Those are honeybees. Those, believe it or not, are Italian. They're from Italy. Italian honeybees are one of the ones that most, many of the uh, beekeepers use, also Russian or canola uh, bees. But there's probably a, a honeybee that's local to Kentucky, but it's, it's got a problem and nobody uses it. It evidently is too docile or it doesn't put, put out a lot of honey. Um, you remember the, the killer bees from South uh, Africa? They got released by accident in, in Latin America. Gonna kill everybody. Uh, didn't come to pass. <laughs> uh, I heard rumors of them they killed a, a dog or something like that many year, years ago. But uh, they didn't end up being as mean as, they, as people thought they were. As aggressive as a bee is, the more aggressive, the more honey they put up. That's why people like the, those bees. But they can also be very uh, dangerous, uh, docile. If they're nice and docile, they're not going to not going to get put out much honey. Okay, protect your pollinators. Uh, you said, well, what else can I do to, to, to for native plants? Uh, protect your pollinators. If you're going to spray chemicals, spray them, spray them in the evening. The honeybees will be back in their hive, and there won't be a whole lot of pollinators doing work in the evening, right before dark. Don't do as much as you only do as much as you have to. Uh, get with your beautification committee it, and try to convince them to uh, ask the farmers not to put any more chemicals in the ground than they have to. I know they have to. I know you have to. Here in Kentucky, I have to spray uh, herbicides and fungicides and what have you. Uh, not insecticides. I don't spray insecticides. But spray as little as you have to. Don't spray any more than you have to. And if you do spray, spray in the evening. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, we wanted to stress native plants uh, and go to those websites, find out what you can do to help. This is Master Gardening. I'm your host, Bud Quok. We'll see you next time. Until then, good gardening. Mm -hmm.